Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. So we'll begin the session, inshallah. This one is titled, Help, I'm Losing My Iman. Um, it's, this is a really important topic, obviously, for the community. Uh, and probably everyone goes through a phase in their life where they have certain questions or they start you know, questioning their own faith. And uh, inshallah, today we're going to have Sheikh Navid Aziz, who's a sheikh from Calgary. He asked me to say nothing more, so he's a sheikh from Calgary. And Amal Qasr, who's a Syrian American international spoke, uh, spoken word a poet. Uh, she's, she's been to many places around the world. She's also asked me to keep it very, very short. So uh, I'm sure you'll, you'll find much uh, wisdom, inshallah, from what they have to say today. A few uh, ground rules. Uh, when you speak, please speak in the eye. Uh, you know, don't speak for a collective, for a we. And um, no questions are off the table. Just keep them in alignment to uh, the topic, inshallah. And um, we're just gonna, I'm going to pass over the mic and uh, they're going to you know, have a little uh, introduction, or a little, uh, little talk, and then from there we'll have open Q&A. If you want to raise your hand, ask a question, feel free to. Uh, we'll have a few volunteers as well uh, going around with questions, uh, with sticky notes. So, uh, I'll pass it off to Amen. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Salatu wassalamu ala rasulullah wa ala alihi wa sahbihi ajma'in. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh, everybody. Um, I am not Imam Suhaib Webb. That is uh, some pretty noble shoes to fill, mashallah. Um, but I guess some flight delay ended up getting me in this position, so inshallah I can offer some wisdom um, as a young Muslim woman who's dealt with some of these issues. It's, it was such an honor to be asked for this platform specifically. Um, and I'm gonna be giving a talk in a little bit where I'm gonna sort of elaborate on this, but about two weeks before I graduated last December, I had what I call the meltdown. And subhanAllah, um, alhamdulillah, he didn't read my bio, but uh, I asked him not to because there, there, was, there was a lot of things that I have, alhamdulillah, been given the opportunity to do. Um, I've performed poetry in, as of now, nine countries, um, over 60-something cities. I have made my own degree. I've, I've alhamdulillah, by the grace of Allah, um, I've been very lucky. But about two weeks before I graduated, uh, 21 years old, found absolutely no value whatsoever in my accomplishment. It had reached a point where truly, truly, I was, I was far from where I should have been. You know, about nine months prior, I'd gone to Umrah for the first time. SubhanAllah, it's a reviving experience. Before I went, I was really concerned that maybe it wouldn't work on me. You know, that's how sort of washed up in the, the American society I was. Um, keep in mind, I am not a scholar. I am not a sheikh. Um, I am only now beginning to pursue my Islamic education, but I was born and raised in the Islamic school. So I only speak from knowledge, so please keep that in mind. Um, if I need to be corrected, please feel free. Um, but this meltdown, what was interesting about it, subhanAllah, I mean, Maybe it's because I'm a poet or something. I didn't show up to a single exam. I, <laughs> I'd given up on a lot of parts. I'd really gone distant from my family. Um, and I took my car up. We have the Rocky Mountains where I'm from. I took my car to the Rocky Mountains. I was by myself. And you know, I, we think about God, we pray, we, we have all of these words constantly that we use that, that are Muslim words, you could say. You know, when you're praying, you say your Quran, these are the words of Allah. But this was a point, I would say, it was at my lowest. It was my absolute lowest. And I remember asking Allah, why? Like, why is this happening? But what made that moment unique, I mean, we're not supposed to question our qadr, our challenges, but this was the first time that this little 21-year-old girl had spoken to Allah. And it wasn't through salah, it was, it was just driving in the mountains by myself, and it was, wallahi, by Allah. You know, I believe it's a hadith, where if you go walking, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will come running. I swear, guys, like, I felt after I, I had reached that lowest point, and I'm like, why Allah? Why, why, why do I feel this way? Wallahi, I felt, I felt like 
I had come to my God for the first time in a really long time. Um, I don't know if any of you guys have seen Fight Club, which is totally... <laughs> but Tyler Durden says it is only after you have lost everything that you are free to do anything. The difference in this sense was that in my absolute nothingness of self-worth, that is when I found my Lord. And that relationship with him that was so, so personal that for a young person who, I mean, come on, I'm, I'm in America. I don't know what it's like here in Canada. But my parents are afraid for me to leave the house. You know, the school, you're, you're learning, you're writing essays on topics that are not, they are not in the uh, discipline of the Muslims, you could say, for lack of a better term. You're, you're surrounded with fitna, with sex, with drugs, with all of these crazy things. I mean, for the first time, it was in the mountains. And I spoke to Allah. And it's very untraditional. We speak to our Lord in prayer. But that was when I realized that in my absolute nothingness, no wonder the closest you can be to Allah is through sujood. That is the most dignified and most humble position that a human being could be in. And that's when I realized, you know what, it's okay to give up. And I gave up, and wallahi, after that, I mean, there was an element of me that sort of understood how to manage things more, because that's what we do, we submit. And so in a time of really, really, really low iman, I sort of hit rock bottom. And it wasn't that I didn't believe it's that I forgot who was in charge of all of this. I forgot who to turn all of that weight to. And wallahi, I gave it up. And after that, I began writing my book. And this book has been a profound, profound journey into the stories that I learned as a young person. And I know for the youth specifically, you know, we went to Islamic school. There were all those stories we heard. There were some things that were mixed up, things that maybe could have been taught better to us, especially for the women, um, things that, we c that could have really, really helped that struggle of wearing hijab or, or, or managing your faith. Um, but after this moment, I wasn't trying to create meaning out of anything, I was trying to explore it. And so many of those stories, Laylat al Qadr, Isra Ma'raj, like some of these incredible things I hadn't thought about since I was in grade school just came washing back. and. It was at this lowest that I found the greatest, greatest, greatest possible, the creator of existence. You can't get bigger than that, right? And then everything in between started making sense, and it was a lot easier to not necessarily understand, but to manage it. You never say, oh Allah, lessen my load. Make my shoulders stronger. Alhamdulillah. Um, Again, I'm no scholar, I'm nothing. But that experience led me to deciding to go and study Islam for a year. Inshallah, for the first time as a young woman, not as a K through 8th student in a private school. Um, so alhamdulillah, I mean, I guess that's all I can really say. I don't know what questions it would open up, but I will pass the mic on, inshallah, to the Sheikh. Jazakallah khair. Thank you for sharing that. Jazakallah khair. Bismillah, alhamdulillah, wa salatu wa salamu ala rasulillah wa ala alihi wa sahbihi wa man wa ala ma ba'd. You know, in her story, you learned the power of storytelling. And when you can learn to empathize with people and learn to see where they're coming from, you can better relate and help people uh, through their issues. Now, one thing I think we should realize just being in this room, number one is that if you look around you, you'll realize that having a decrease in faith is not an abnormal thing. Everyone goes through it. And this is something that you should not feel ashamed of. Why am I feeling this? Because everyone goes through it at one point or another. It's part of the human experience. And the second thing you realize is that you're in a very privileged position right now that you've taken a step forward in the right direction of wanting to do something. For myself, Alhamdulillah, I don't think I've ever had a major crisis in faith. I felt my faith go down in terms of the actions that I do from time to time, but I haven't had a major crisis, and that's something I thank Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for. 
But from the theological studies that I've taken, I want to share just three simple principles with you that a lot of people get confused on. Faith is not about how you feel. It's about what you're willing to do. So a lot of times people feel, hey, I feel really good right now. My faith must be high. Or I feel really, really down right now, so my faith must be low. But the reality is the way you feel has very little to do with what your faith actually is. Faith, my dear brothers and sisters, is about what you're willing to put forward for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And when you're doing really bad things sometimes, you will feel really good. You can't confuse that for faith. And sometimes when you're doing something really, really good, it doesn't actually feel all that great in that moment. Do not confuse that for faith either. Number two is that in order to attain faith, you have to struggle. It's not something that's going to be put on your plate. It's not something that's going to fall on your lap. It is something you have to struggle for. It is something you have to take a step in the right direction for. And I'll just share a simple example with you. 17 times a day, we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, Oh, guide us to the straight path. Oh, Allah, guide us to the straight path. In order to get to that position, what did you need to do? You needed to wake up in the morning. You needed to make wudu. You needed to find clothes to pray in. You need to find a place to pray. And then you need to actually start praying before you ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for guidance. Effort is required for you to reach that state where you're asking Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for guidance. Now here's the beauty of that dua. Allah answered that dua before you even made it. Because it is only those that are guided that will ask for guidance. It is only those that are guided that will struggle for their faith. And this is what the sister is talking You walk to Allah, Allah comes running. But you need to take that first step. And then here's like, you know, the, the kick in the face almost. Where if you do not embrace guidance, it gets taken away from you. What does that look like? I want you to think about the times our alarm clock went off for Fajr. And then we consciously turned it off. Not, oh, you slept through it. Not, oh, you're like in this knocked out state where you just hit it not knowingly. Consciously, we turned off that alarm clock and just went back to sleep. That is when you don't embrace faith. When you don't embrace faith, faith gets snatched away from you, and then you need to strive super hard again to get back to where you were. So the key is always never, never consciously reject faith. Because when it comes knocking, you have to embrace it. If you don't, it gets snatched away. Three simple points. Do not confuse your emotions for faith. Number two, you have to strive hard for faith and that begins by taking that first step and Allah will come to you. And then number three, once guidance comes to you, you have to embrace it. So I think if you can put what I've said in these three points with what our sister was mentioning in her personal experience, inshallah, we can open up the floor for some amazing discussion. And that's where I'm hoping you guys will contribute, inshallah. Great. So volunteers, would you be able to go around for any more personal questions? And we can start off the, uh, the questions with you, brother. Go ahead. That you should not confuse emotions for faith. Inshallah, you won't either. How would you recognize it? Excellent. Excellent. Very good question. So the first part I was talking about is emotions. People generally feel that if my iman is high, I need to feel good. But there are other things that we will be doing where we feel good, but our iman is slumping. Someone doing drugs, someone drinking alcohol, someone being promiscuous in their relationships. They're going to feel good when they're doing those deeds. But it does not mean that has anything to do with iman. If anything, their iman is slumping at that time. The exact opposite is it. The initial phases of starting to pray they are so difficult, they are so hard. And you will question, why am I doing this? Why is this so painful? Why is this so hard? You will feel terrible, but that is what true faith looks like. And often, if we do not understand the distinction between faith and emotions, you'll get confused very easily. Now, the second thing of how do you recognize a crisis of faith? I will rec I'll just share a small story with you, and then I want to just elaborate with two points on it. I, I was with... Uh, one of my favorite speakers, Numan Ali Khan, the very first time I met him. And there was this sister that came in, and I was like, man, then this is bad of me, and I'm sharing this with you, I'm just being completely honest with you. 
I was so judgmental of her. She had like the weirdest haircut, like it was really shaped weird. She had like purple hair, tattoos all over her body, a piercing in her nose. And I was like, how is she at an Islamic conference? I thought all these things, I never said any of these things. She comes down and she's like, my mom told me to speak to you. And I was like, okay, so now I can see where this is going. And she says, and he says, what did your mom want me to speak to you about? She says, well, my mom thinks I'm having a crisis in faith. And he says, do you think that's really happening? And she's like, I don't even know what I believe anymore. And he's like, well, let me ask you a question. When was the last time you read the Quran? And she says, if I'm going to be honest with you, like 10 years ago maybe. And he says, well, that is when the crisis of faith began. An individual that reads the Quran on a regular basis, that is an indication of faith. And that is a, a striving of wanting to hold on to the faith. But a person that gives up a daily reading of the Quran, his crisis of faith has began and he didn't even realize it. Now, this is very exaggerated, but it's in the right direction. That as soon as we stop actively pursuing faith, that's when we're having a minor crisis in faith, not a major crisis in faith. What does major crisis in faith look like? It comes down to one of two things. Either you're overcome by such immense desire that you no longer want to practice your faith. So someone is overcome by something that they know is wrong and they're intentionally going to pursue that wrong even if it means sacrificing their faith. Or number two is from the realm of doubt. That someone is sincere but there's just a doubt in their mind that is getting so powerful that it overcomes their own logic, overcomes their own faith and they start having that doubt. So that is what a major crisis in faith looks like. But I think the second we become complacent, the second we become apathetic towards pursuing further guidance is a minor form of a crisis in faith. And each and every single day, we need to ask ourselves, what did I do to increase my faith? What did I do to protect my faith? What am I doing to become a stronger Muslim? Because if you're not improving on the previous day, then you're doing something wrong. And that's what I would share. Would you like to share anything? Oh, no. I actually have a question. <laughs> <laughs> Sure. If that's all right. Um, so f let's say right now, I mean, at least in America, I'm not sure what it's like here in Canada. I wish I knew more of the community. But you have people who have become so estranged from the religion that, that picking up the Quran is so far out. Of course. In that situation, for those who are coming to seek guidance, is picking up the Quran the first step? What would the first step be for them? Excellent. So people that feel estranged to the degree that, hey, what should the first step be? I think the first step is trying to figure out why do you need guidance? Why do you need faith? What role do you want faith to play in your life? Right? If you don't feel faith is important in your life, why are you going after it? You should not go after faith because your parents tell you. You should not go after faith because it's a cool thing to do with all the MSA kids. You should not go after faith because you know, some sort of worldly reason. You go after faith because you have this conviction deep down inside that it is the right thing to do. That faith is give, going to give me salvation. Faith is going to bring me eternal happiness in paradise. Faith is what is going to make me a better person at the end of the day. And that is what you should do. After that, I always tell people, you have to speak to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. You have to get things off of your chest as human beings, it is normal. We cannot let the guilt inside us rot our insides. You need to let all of it go. And the only one that will not judge you, the only one that will always forgive you, the only one that will embrace you in any state is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So you need to have that honest conversation where you let go of all the things that are bothering you, confess all the sins that you have committed, and then always conclude with, Oh Allah, Help me, guide me, protect me, keep me under your mercy. And that's what I would say you would begin. And then once you've made that first step, the next thing I would do, and this is the third piece of advice, is find someone that can help you through this process. Either an imam in the community that you trust, a friend that you have that is practicing, anyone that can help you in that process. But make sure there's someone that can help you through that process. Because you shouldn't be alone in this process, inshallah. Allahu Akbar. Yeah, of course. Any other questions? Hands? Yes, please.
Yeah. Um, that is an incredibly relevant question, something that a lot of the girls in my community have been asking. And I did a little research, and what do you do for someone that you might feel envy towards? You make dua for them. MashaAllah, Bismillah, may Allah guide them, may Allah preserve them. And that is a, that's a crazy act of submission. Because at that point, like, one, you recognize that it is not up to you who has what and what you have always. And at that point, I mean, there was a point, you know, when I'm starting as a poet, like, you got like 13 year old makeup artist with like five million more followers than me. And you know, you're like, what is this? Like, that's not fair. But then you say, mashallah. And wallahi, like, it's crazy because it's like, whether you like it or not, you are acknowledging that which was given to someone else and you are sacrificing to the creator that which you can't change. We strive to be better, ideally. And I know that like in, in, in our community, the women especially, man, there's some mean, mean like jealousy and gossip and it gets really, really violent and angering and it's, it's a scary thing, but once you learn how to make dua for someone, man, that's, it's nice. Go through your Instagram, try it out. <laughs> that's all I can say. Um, so the newest Spider-Man movie just came out. And, you know, I, I have this thing about superhero movies. I'm not sure if Sheikh Saad shared this, but he has like an infatu infatuation with superhero movies, as do I, but we're on completely different opposite sides. He's purely DC, I'm purely Marvel. And we like always, you know, hack it out. But I, I like to approach these things from an Islamic perspective. But what can this superhero teach me? So before I answer the sister's question, let me ask you all of you a question. What is the greatest lesson that Spider-Man has taught you? And I want to just get three answers, inshallah. Go ahead. Excellent. Good. That's the one that I was thinking of. And that's the one I want to share. What else? What else have we learned from Spider-Man? Sometimes you have to make sacrifices for the greater good. Excellent. What else? One last one. Yeah. There comes a time when you can't always save everyone. Allahu Akbar. Allahu Akbar. <laughs> so as you can see, you can take a, a non-Muslim concept and you can derive lessons from it with an Islamic frame of mind. Now, the way I will approach the sister's question, just focusing on the very first quote, with great power comes great responsibility. When you see someone have something that you desire, understand that perhaps that is a test for them that they might be failing. Because our nature of tests is either we test it through trials or we test it through prosperity. Mm -hmm. And the test through prosperity is so much more difficult. Because that test of prosperity means I have to be extra good, I have to be extra thankful, I have to be extra obedient to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Whereas when a person is tried to a, through a calamity, worshiping Allah, making dua to Allah, you know, all those things come so easy. So if you see someone being given something that you want, and that you desire, this is the step-by-step -step process that I would take. Number one is that, as she mentioned, make dua for them, that Allah blesses them in it, and that's just to protect them from the evil eye. Number two, make dua to Allah, that, oh Allah, if this is good for me, then grant it to her and to me. And that's what I would say. And then number three, start looking at all the things that you have that that person doesn't have. Because each and every one of us has a gift, has a talent, has something that we have that other people don't have that they wish that we have. At the very end of the day, you might be like, I am broke, I have nothing. Well, at the end of the day, you live in North America where you have access to clean water, where you have access to hot water, where you have access to electricity, where you have loving parents, where you have a community that cares for you. These are all things that other parts of the world do not have. And that within of itself is something that you should be grateful for. So sh change the frame of mind rather than being a frame of mind of you know, coveting, be, build a mind of gratitude. That Allah's mercy is so vast that everyone has a share in it. And when my time is going to come, Allah will give me what I ask for and what I want and what is best for me. Because sometimes you will want something but it's not best for you. So ask for what is best rather than asking for what you desire. Allahu Akbar. Why don't you share? What did you do as soon as you started feeling that 
SubhanAllah, I mean, the difference was that I, had, I hadn't realized that it was a crisis in faith at the time, that I hadn't been depending on my Lord as much as I should. And so I think the first, SubhanAllah, this, I don't know if this, is, if this is actually in the scholarship, but my brother showed me something interesting. The word kufur, we all know what the word kufur is, right? It, it's the disbelief, but it, it means to cover, like to veil your heart. The opposite of it comes from the same three letters, fakir, to reflect. And I think, and this is going to be any psychologist tells you this, um, any human, I don't know, counseling, you name it, is that the first thing you need to do is you need to reflect on what's actually going on. When you start doubting your faith or something like that, you got to actually take a look at everything that's going on around you. What's your relationship like with your mother? I would say that's the first thing in faith. You want to know what your faith looks like? What is your relationship with your mother? You want to know what your religion looks like? What is your relationship with your father? What's going on with your family? Who are your friends? What does your day-to-day -day activity look like? I mean, yes, it's good to reflect on the universe and everything like that, and, and, and God, whether he exists or not, and things like that, but, but to pinpoint exactly where you are in your life to comprehend what might be triggering these doubts when they started, that would really provide insight from an individual standpoint on what exactly you're dealing with. Because sometimes when you don't know what the source is, you're gonna push out a lot of anger. You're gonna, be, you're gonna start blaming the masjid. You're gonna start blaming the elders. You're gonna start blaming, well, you know, they're so angry in Saudi Arabia, or they're so this and this and this, and then all of a sudden, your trial becomes, the, becomes projected on everyone else, right? And you're kind of covering yourself, and you're not really reflecting. The only way we see light is by ref reflection. It's the only way light is possible to be seen. You know, the molecules, they have to reflect on something in order for us to comprehend the colors that we are seeing. And, and in the same way, it is, you can't just throw out the crisis. Sometimes you have to look inward before you are able to understand that, that outward reality, like your relationship with God, like the state of the Ummah and things like that. It helps to know who you are first before you're able to understand the, in, the creator of the entire existence. Allahu um, A'lam. Pertaining to doubt, I would say the first thing I would make clear is we should distinguish and differentiate between wanting to understand our faith versus questioning our faith. There's a big difference between the two. We are required to understand our faith. None of us should follow our faith blindly. So when we pray, we should understand why we are praying. When we read the Quran, we should understand why we're doing it. But at the same time, there is a boundary that we do not cross, which is to question our faith. Meaning, who is Allah to tell me to do this? Who is Allah to dictate this to me? That sort of thing becomes very negative. So if a person is wanting to understand their faith, that's very positive and is encouraged. If a person starts questioning Allah, that becomes very, very problematic. Number two is that I want you to imagine guidance is like a seed. What would happen if you tried to plant a seed in cement? It wouldn't grow, right? The cement that I'm referring to is your heart. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala constantly tells us that the people who disbelieve their hearts become hardened or people that sin you know, perpetually, their hearts become hardened. And when you try to plant that seed of guidance in a hard heart, it's not going to, to flourish. So you need to make sure your heart is pure. You need to make sure you've cured the diseases of your hearts from arrogance, pride, you know, lack of sincerity. Take away all of those things and make sure your heart is ready to receive guidance. And this is where the third step comes in, where in order to truly remove the doubt, you need to remove it with knowledge. That means by asking pertinent questions, by listening to lectures that are relevant, listening to things that will address the doubt that you're facing. And only after that, will you truly be taking the doubt away? But keep this in mind as well. Shaitan is so active that you might eradicate one doubt now, give it a couple of months, give it a couple of weeks, give it a couple of years, another doubt is gonna come croaching in. And it's gonna be the same process again, and you're gonna go through it again. But understand that while you're going through this process, if you're patient with it, Allah is rewarding you each step of the way. Each step of the way you're being rewarded. 
And just keep remembering that the Prophet ﷺ, the epitome of guidance, the pinnacle of guidance, he would actively engage in dua, Ya muqallib al-qulub, thabit qalbi ala deenik. That, oh Allah, turn of the hearts, make my heart firm upon your religion. Not because he had a crisis in faith, but to remind us that even when you're not having a crisis in faith, keep asking for that, because you never know when faith can be taken away from you. So that would be some of my advice. Wallahu alam. Hands. No? I can go. Oh, go ahead. Please. Without a shadow of a doubt. I, mean, I wholeheartedly agree with you that part of your journey is about who you surround yourself with. And that's why the Prophet ﷺ himself is that be careful of who you befriend because you're on the faith of your friend. So if your person, your friend, your best friend is like a terrible person, whether you want to admit it or not, deep down inside you're not that great of a person. Um, and it's very important to do that. I know you want to say something. Yeah. Go ahead. They had a national study actually. Um, it was published by like Business Insider or Forbes or something, basically showing that you are the average of the five people you spend most of your time with. Now, Rasulullah you, you are on the faith of your friends, right? The Business Insider says the same thing. And um, yeah, the reality is well, these, this is where you are sort of like festering exactly who you are. And yeah, that's an incredible point. I mean. My mother's family, my mom converted when she was 15 years old to Islam. She was a little white girl from Iowa. You know, her, her parents were alcoholics. I mean, I looked at the family tree, it had a history of alcoholism. Um, had it not been for the one Pakistani girl who was in her school, maybe she would have never been exposed quite as easily. Um, SubhanAllah. And you know what? To, to deny the opportunity of friendship. I mean, Rasulullah he had Jewish friends, he had Jewish neighbors. His own uncle did not convert to Islam. I and mean, when it comes to matters of faith, for sure, but when it comes to matters of friendships, I mean, we have a responsibility to our neighbors. And in a sense, your friends are, are sort of how you can manifest that goodness. By being good to them, you are accountable for them. So I think it's a beautiful comment, for sure, because I know a lot of people can be afraid of non-Muslim friends, you know? But like you said, as long as you know who you are, you're good, you're safe, inshallah. So, uh, you know, it's funny that the statistics she shared, I, I had actually heard that a long time ago. And I'll share a story with you of a, a young man coming into my room, in my office, and he's like, Sheikh, I'm having a crisis in faith. And the very first like, question I asked him is, who are, the first, who are the five people on your speed dial? And this is like back in the day when speed dial was a big thing. So we went through his speed dial, and number three was his weed dealer. And I was like, bro, that is your problem right there. <laughs> the third person on your speed dial is like mom, best friend, and then, you know, uh, his weed dealer. You got to get rid of that person. So I think the first step is recognizing the bad influences in your life and saying, you know, I wish you the best. Bye-bye. We're parting ways here. So getting rid of the bad influences of your life and truly getting rid of them. Not like, hey, you know, sometime later in the future we might hang out again, but saying, for now, this is it. We're done. Then number two... The real struggle is in finding good companionship. I think because we've gotten so addicted to engaging the world through our phones, we don't know how to build real relationships anymore. We don't even know where to begin real relationships anymore. Like, alhamdulillah, I feel blessed that I came from a generation 
that we enjoyed playing sports together. We enjoyed, you know, going hiking together. We enjoyed human interaction. We didn't have these things. But now I can understand the challenge of this is the only form of interaction that you know. Building meaningful relationships is in a challenge. But what I would suggest is start off with local community events. Every community has a masjid. Go and find out what events are going on. Attend those events. See like-minded people. And if you're will willing to be vulnerable with people, they will be vulnerable with you. And that's where true relationships are built. And people need to see that sometimes, where people are always on edge. People are always afraid of showing their true selves. But as soon as someone does it, all of a sudden everyone opens up. I think that was like the beautiful thing about the gathering, that we started with her story, and now everyone feels comfortable sharing it because, hey, if she can share, I can share. And that's the way it should be. We should all feel safe in who we are and knowing that Allah is our ultimate judge. There's no one that anyone in this room can do or say that is going to affect my relationship with Allah. That's between me and Him. So similarly with us, when we're trying to build those relationships, be vulnerable with people, they will be vulnerable with you, and that's the beginning of a good relationship. Allahu Alam. I know um, before meltdown, it's kind of my timeline, um, I really, 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 really struggled with my salah. Um, and it would, you know, I've spoken to a lot of hijabis specifically, which is interesting because there's sort of the expectation, well, if you're wearing hijab, you know, your worship is on point, um, which isn't always the case. And when I had sort of gone through whatever it was I went through, and Salah became more of how I shaped my day as opposed to being like, I'll figure it out, you know, right before Asr comes, where to pray the hood. Dude, straight up, not only does that change the way you're dressed, knowing that you're gonna be outside of the house, changes where you're gonna be, changes how prepared you are. You gotta know, you got, either you got a water bottle in your backpack to make wudu, or you know you're gonna be on campus and you got the library to pray in. And for me, like that, that comeback, it was Salah, like really getting that on point. And when you got, when you, when you can try to prioritize that, it took a lot of mental energy to get to that priority status. I can't pretend like it was so easy and immediate. But then like, you know, for those who don't wear hijab, they're gonna bring the hijab. For me, you know, I, may Allah guide us all, you know, I, got, I get ready to bring extra socks and a prayer skirt. You know, just in case my jeans are too tight or something like that. And, and you know, your, your whole world, just by that second pillar, man, it changes where you're at, what your timing is, what you're focused on. And wallahi, it is a good way because sometimes you're not always going to have the friends to motivate you. But even just even being alone, you're way better off. You know, you got that water bottle in your back, stop on the side of the road and go pray. It's not always safe where I'm from, but you know, I've done it before, alhamdulillah. And I've prayed next to rivers before and you never know what you're gonna end up by. And if you prioritize salah, wallahi, it feels like, it feels like your day is different. It's shaped differently. They say instead of trying to fit it in your day, create salah as the pillars and then stuff all of the other stuff you gotta do in there. It's really, really helped me personally. Um, Allahu alam. I'm gonna say that more often, wallah, it's very good. You had a question? MashaAllah.
<laughs> you know, one thing that, Jazakallah for sharing that story, that is absolutely remarkable. But one thing I will like, commend you for is something that I think we overlook as a community. And that is the uh, emotional affiliation that we develop with religion. Mm. And what I, I really liked is the fact that each and every single day, you and your husband, we gather your children together and just spend quality time with them, talking and discussing. And that one of itself helps so much. For a lot of young people, when they grow up, the emotional affiliation with religion is terrible. That, oh, you've been a bad kid today, go to your room and read Quran. Then as they grow older, they start hating the Quran because they've affiliated these negative emotions with it. So I'd like to commend you for that positive affiliation. Jazakallah for setting that example. Thank you so much. Just one thing really quickly. We have about eight minutes left. Um, so just giving everybody a heads up there. Sorry. Of course, without a shadow of a doubt. And I'll, I'll share a story from my life. So my wife and I made a conscious decision that we were going to homeschool our kids for the rest of our lives. And I think up until grade three, it was working really, really well. Till my wife's like, hey, I don't think I can handle this anymore. So I was like, no worries. We'll just send them to Islamic school. After the second week of Islamic school, my younger daughter comes home. And she's like, Baba, can you tell me who Harry Styles is? <laughs> And I was like, who's Harry Styles? I'm like, what is Harry Styles? <laughs> is he a character in the book? What is he? Go on to Google Harry Styles, and I'm like, what are you learning in Islamic school? <laughs> and for me, this was like a decisive moment. I'd be like, I could get angry at her. I could tell her off. And she's like, you're never going to Islamic school again. Or we can sit down and have a talk about, hey, where do we stand on music as Muslims? Where do we stand on you know, boy band groups? Where do we stand on you know, all these issues? And I decided that's what I was going to do. And for me, that was a turning point that had Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala not sent me that opportunity, I wouldn't have had this awakening of, hey, that's how I need to approach my parenting. But what we fail to realize is that our methods of parenting, unless we actively learn how to parent, they're going to reflect the way we were parented. So the way my dad got angry is the way I get angry. And that's the way I will continue to get angry up and until I make a conscious decision that, hey, I don't want to get angry like that anymore. And I think what you're mentioning right now is a very valid point that up until we can make faith relevant to people, up until we can teach it in an easy and gentle manner, up until we can make them feel optimistic and positive with their faith, our children will continue to have a crisis in faith. We have to keep doing that in a very positive, relevant fashion. And I was going to say this as my concluding remarks, but I'll share it now because time is running out and I'll pass it over to Amal to share her concluding remarks. The greatest threat to Islam is not persecution. We are not going to be bombed. We're not going to be killed. They cannot put all of us in jail. They cannot kill all of us out of the United States, America or Canada. But the greatest threat from Islam is going to come within, from within. When people start developing apathy as a result of cultural irrelevance. Meaning that people no longer find their faith relevant in the public sphere and therefore they stop caring about faith. And I think as a community, that is what's happening. You arrive to Jummah at the Masjid, the Imam is speaking about what to do if you find a dead goat in the middle of a street. Real khutbah, my friend heard. And I was like, what on earth are you doing? So it has to be a two-way street. Number one, you on the ground have to be, on your own personal level, struggle hard for your faith, keep studying your religion, clarify all of those doubts, and just you know, be open-minded towards embracing those challenges. But from the top, there needs to be higher expectations from all of you towards your faith leadership saying, hey, you need to do a better job in relating to us in the way that you speak to us about the topics that you speak about. Because we think we're doing a phenomenal job when we speak about what to do if you find a goat in the middle of a street. Because that's what our books talk about 80, 1400 years ago. That's not relevant now. But our faith, the dynamics of faith have changed. And therefore, we need to become more relevant through your help. So if you see the imam being irrelevant rather than hey, saying stupid imam or saying bad things about him, go up to him and tell him, hey, you could have approached this topic in a different fashion, and this is what's happening on the ground right now, so next week, why don't you speak about that? So develop that relationship with your imam, where not only can the imam guide you towards you know, increasing your faith and protecting it, 
but you can also help the Imam protect the community by becoming more relevant and by inspiring optimism as well, inshallah. Wallahu alam. Um, you know, I want to point out something that distinguishes the Muslim um, from the rest of society. And of course, it looks easier out there. A lot of our friends, they don't got to worry about this five daily prayers, dressing a certain way, eating a certain way, washing a certain way. I mean, we have so many components, but on a different spectrum, the thing that blew me away most, the thing that made me realize how different we really are from the others, I mean, there's descriptions of the entire universe on a leaf, on this huge tree that marks the end of the dimension as we know it. We have stories of the angels who hold Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's throne. We have stories of what the heavens look like, what hell looks like. We have, we have stories of creation that root the beginning. And, and the thing is, it's not, you can't throw this to, some, to an atheist and, and be like, believe it. But what it, what it does is it captures the human imagination and expands it far beyond what is before you. To imagine a size of existence where the heaven and earth are on a leaf, that, that changes how small you are and how much larger the world is from you. The reason why I bring this up is, verily there are signs for those who reflect Right? We hear this in the Quran. And sometimes we don't always have the resources to give explanations to those things we question about regarding our faith. Not necessarily whether it's true or not, but how we can apply it in a relevant way. And I think the biggest thing that's helped me with my faith, honestly, I would recommend 100% go and listen to the story of Jibreel by Omar Suleiman. Wallahi, it will just dazzle your mind. It will change your life. Listen to the stories of the Prophet. Listen to the Day of Judgment, you know, the, the pillars of faith. There's some crazy stories in there. There's, there's, I said before that, the difference be, that there's a difference between faith and religion. Relig religion is what you do. As far as, you know, the guidelines, faith is what you're willing to do, um, as the sheikh said. It's, it's what's in your heart. And there is some profound inspiration that comes from listening to the things that are way beyond us. And this is where the faith comes from, in that wonderment, in that awe of the greater, greater, greater one. Because how can you find a point in worshiping if if you don't realize what your creator has done, you must reflect. Allah is amazing, subhanahu wa ta'ala. And it's, it's been a fun journey to, to explore arkan al-iman, the pillars of faith. Um, because it's beyond the imagination and it's something that not even the, the zodiac believers, a lot of the Christians, a lot of those types of people of all different faiths, they don't have that opportunity. Because subhanAllah, you can get all of these different layers and you end up at one God. And I think the belief in one God, Tawheed, that, that's gonna be your summary of your faith. And seriously, get to know, get to know the majestic parts of our religion. And, and, and it might make the practicing of those five pillars, the Salah and everything much easier. Know who you're worshiping. Get to know your creator because, dude, there ain't no president as powerful as the one who created him and everything else. You know, these are just my words of wisdom, advice that I've encountered. And I hope that, inshallah, you guys have benefited, taken some wisdom out of this. It was an honor to be up here, replace Imam Suhaib Webb. That's a crazy thing. Um, but Jazakumullah khair. Thank you, everybody. I appreciate you all. And Jazakallah.